speaker tonight is uh, is Joe Wright, and he told me this afternoon that his lesson has to do, as you may have seen in your bulletin, I just noticed a minute ago, grace and sin. Uh, we're going to sing about the grace part. He can speak about the sin part. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Amazing grace. song and then uh, Jeff Joyner will lead us in our first prayer this evening. Together here again this afternoon. Uh, it turned out to be a beautiful day. Thank you for that. Help all those inflicted with all the illnesses that they're going through. Help those in our church uh, become better Christians to the best of our abilities. Uh, help those who have lost property and uh, had other damages over in Dexter. 
And anybody else who's uh, needing any type of help, just help them get through this time to have hope and maybe get to you and find their way to heaven one day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're using a book and need to mark the invitation song after Joe's lesson, it is 179, 179. And we'll sing this song to introduce us to this song. history guy, so I really enjoy the history of the early church and seeing Paul's conversion from Saul. I love the stories where he goes to different towns throughout uh, the Middle East area. I especially love the book of Daniel and the stories within it. I love the BBS stories of Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I really enjoy um, Nebuchadnezzar and his transformation from this guy that didn't know God to a guy that started worshiping God at the end of his life. I really love the book of Esther and how um, even though God isn't mentioned, we see him through every single verse within the pages. I even love a lot of the prophets uh, like uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah and how they told Israel their fault. They told Israel judgments through beautiful language. But no doubt my favorite book of the Bible is the book of Judges. This book is one of my favorite books to read of all time. There's so many wacky fun, and enjoyable stories throughout this book. And if I just had to flip to one chapter to make me laugh, I would flip to the book of Judges. 
just weird events. I love the story of Ehud, who, decide, who uh, God made stab a fat king with his left hand uh, in his bathroom, or probably in his bathroom. I love the story of Sisera, who, running away from a judge of Israel, uh, he stayed in the tent, started drinking milk, and then while he was sleeping, he got uh, killed by a spike straight through his skull. I love the stories of Samson and Gideon, all these wacky and weird stories that I just can't believe are in the Bible. I love the stories of Jephthah, just a bunch of weird characters out of the book. It's just a ton of fun to read. Unfortunately, Judges, at the end of the book, becomes a tragedy, though. This book of hilarious events, of funny events, of weird events, suddenly by the end becomes a tragedy, becomes heartbreaking for the nation of Israel. So why is this? Why all of a sudden does Judges come from a happy, or not happy, but a funny, fun book to read to a book of sadness and despair? <coughs> well, I'll just tell you why in a sec, but let's first talk about the book right before, the book of Joshua. Now in this book, Joshua and the Israelites are commanded to conquer Canaan's land. They're commanded to cast out all the Canaanites in Joshua chapter 11, verse 20. And why is this? Well, the purpose is so that the Israelites aren't tempted to follow the false gods of the Canaanites, to not become like the Canaanites. Because the Canaanites were evil. They served Baal. They did evil things. They did ch child sacrifice. They were evil people. And God did not want them to become this way. God did not want his promised people, people of Israel to turn out like that. And that's what Leviticus chapter 18 talks about. It talks about how uh, God wanted to force these people out of the land so Israel would not be tempted to become like this evil group. And when we finish with this book of Joshua, we see, or it seems like, they did this. They did what God commanded. That they drove out the Canaanites and won their battles. And they pushed all the Canaanites out from the promised land of Canaan. But when we turn to the book of Judges, we see that is not the case at all. That the conquest and the pushing of the Canaanites are not complete whatsoever. If you could now turn to Joshua chapter 1, verse 27, we see here that this conquest is far from over, and that not only are they not killing and destroying these people and casting them out, but they're allowing them to stay within the Israelite community. Read there in verse 27, it says there that the tribe of Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants, and instead in verse 28 it talks about how the Canaanites were put into forced labor, forced labor within these communities where they could talk to the Israelites. Then we have the tribe of Ephraim, uh, did, who in verse 29 did not drive out the Canaanites and even did worse than the other tribe. They allowed the Canaanites to live among them, not even in forced labor, but just within their houses. We see the tri tribe of Zebulon do the exact same thing, allowing the Canaanites within their community with forced labor. We see the tribe of Asher doing the same thing that Ephraim did, allowing the Canaanites within their households, allowing them to talk and learn about their culture of evil. And this, the rest of the uh, first chapter talks about this incomplete conquest, this incomplete casting out of the Canaanites. And this really upsets God. This really makes God furious because they did not obey God at all. And then what we see in chapter 2, starting in verse 2, the punishment that God is laying out. God is tired of the Israelites not following him, so he decides to punish them in that verse. Go ahead and read there. In the end of verse 2. But you have not obeyed my voice, talking to the Israelites. What is this that you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. So God is laying out a punishment for the Israelites for not following him, for not casting out the Canaanites. He is allowing the Canaanites to stay in the land as a temptation for the people of Israel. He is allowing them to stay there, to be a snare, to be a thorn in their side, hurting them uh, all the time. And they are really upset by this. They see this problem. They are super upset with themselves that they did not trust God. So what happens? In verse 4, they decide to repent. They fall on their hands and knees and pray to God asking for help. In verse 4 it says there, As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words, not a day after kind of thinking about what God has said, but the exact moment after the angel of the Lord had said this, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called 
the name of that place, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. So they are remorseful. They are um, saddened by what they did. They are upset with themselves that they have committed this grave sin. Unfortunately, though, this repentance is short-lived. This saddening of their events, or saddening of their sin, is short-lived. And they are right back at it again in verse 11. If you want to go and read there. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went af after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them. And they bowed down to them and provoked the Lord to anger. We see here that the Israelites are doing more evil than ever before. Even though they just repented and were saddened by disobeying God, they're going even further. Now they're obeying Baal. They're obeying the Canaanite God or gods. And God is furious, furious at them. God is so upset that he decides to punish them in the next few verses. And he decides to punish them by allowing the Canaanites to take over them. Uh, allowing the Canaanites to defeat them and take them captive. And from there, we see that the Israelites, once again, are asking for repentance. Now that they are captured, now that they are defeated, God, they are asking God for help. So what does God do? Just as all the songs that Dennis sang just for us just a few minutes ago, God gave them grace. God has so much grace, love, and mercy that they gave these, this people that disobeyed God more grace, love, and mercy. So what does God do? He raises up a judge. Now, most of us know what judges are, but just in case that no one knows, judges in, judges in the Bible are not people with gavels and gowns. Instead, they are mighty warriors. They are mighty warriors to help uh, the people of Israel escape the Canaanites, for the people of Israel to defeat the Canaanites within the land. So God decides to send them this judge, this judge to help them out. But unfortunately, as soon as the judge helps them, in verse 16, they directly disobey the judge just a little bit long, just a little bit later. And then as soon as the judge dies, they become more evil than ever. Look there in verse 17 of chapter 2. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they went after other gods and bowed down to them. As soon as they turned aside from their ways of, the, of their fathers had lot, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. And then in verse 19 it says, but whenever the judge died, they turned back, and they were more corrupt than their fathers. They were more corrupt than the people that were evil. They were doing more evil stuff after they asked for God's grace. They, every time God sent them a judge, every time God gave them grace, every time God gave them love, God gave them mercy, they fell right back into sin because they were just using God to their advantage. They were using God's love for them, their, his grace, his mercy, and his love to the Israelites' advantage. And whenever we use God's grace to our advantage, sin takes advantage of us. And we see that um, at the end of the book of Judges. Go ahead and turn it one more time. So we see at the end of the book of Judges that the people of Israel are, Israel are now turning far evil. They have been disobeying God from chapter 3 to chapter 16. Uh, they have disobeyed God. God uh, punishes them. They ask for help. They ask for repentance. God sends them help with, because of his grace, love, and mercy. But the Israelites, as soon as the judge dies, falls even worse into sin. When God is taken advantage of, when, uh, when people take advantage of God's grace, sin takes advantage of them. And this happens terribly in the latter part of the book of Judges. We see the story of this man named Abimelech, which is Gideon's son. And he wants to take power of this town of Shechem. So what does he do? Does he try to run an election? No. Instead, he kills 69 of his stepbrothers. He massacres them with the help of the town of Shechem. Then, just a few years later, Shechem uh, wants to rebel against this king Abimelech. So what does Abimelech do? He burns down the city. He massacres everyone within the city. And from there, he keeps on doing this. He goes from town to town, killing and massacring people until he gets to this final town where after burning and killing a lot of citizens, the 
the final citizens come into this tower, and the woman drops a stone right on Abimelech's head, killing him. Then we see the story of Micah, who decides to make an idol to God from silver. Yes, they were so they didn't understand God so much that he decided to make an idol for God made out of silver. Then he pays this Levite to become a priest of the idol. I mean, we see in the next chapter that some men of Dan decide to come to this tent of Micah and decide to steal the idol along with the priest. And then as they're traveling, they see this town with riches, this peaceful town called Laish. And what do they do? They massacre everyone, all the men, women, and children, and burn down this peaceful town. Then in the next chapter, we see this horrifying story of this Levite, uh, this Levite man uh, getting harassed at his door from this angry mob in this town. And then he decides to throw out his concubine and allow them to abuse her. And then uh, after she is, she crawls back to the house and uh, right at his doorstep, whether dead or alive, he cuts her up and sends her out to the 12 tribes of Israel. And from then on, we see the civil war between the Benjamite, Benjamites and the 12 other tribes of Israel creating Israel's first civil war. All three of these stories shows us what Israel has become. Shows us that when we take advantage of God's love and grace, when we sin and we continuously sin, taking advantage of God's grace, sin bites back harshly. And when that happens, we fall into death, destruction, and humiliation. And it's just absolutely terrible. Now, some people in Christianity believe that as soon as they're baptized, you can continue to sin because you have an unlimited grace card, kind of. Many people at school uh, that were kind of, they believed in God, but they weren't really Christian all the time. They didn't really act Christ-like. They said this to me. They said that, oh, yeah, I can, even if I sin, even if I lie, even if I commit adultery, even though I steal, I can just ask God for grace, and he'll give it to me. And yes, God will do that. They don't realize that sin has devastating effects. Sin brings death and destruction wherever it goes. Romans chapter 7 verse 13 talks about how sin is the cause of death. That sin uh, is, brings upon evil and destruction. Romans chapter 6 verses 20 through 23 talk about how the fruit of sin is death. But not the fruit of good. Not the fruit of God. But instead the fruit of sin is death. And then we see in Hebrews chapter 10 what happens when we do take advantage of God's grace. When we continuously and deliberately sin, it brings upon us a judgment of fire. It brings upon us a judgment and a terrible thing. When we allow sin to stay in our lives constantly, when we allow God's grace, when we take advantage of God's grace and continue and continue and continue to sin deliberately, Death, destruction, and a judgment of sin will come upon us. Go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 6 for me. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Here is a very famous passage where it talks about sinning deliberately, or sinning and taking advantage of God's grace. And it says right there in verse 1 of chapter 6 of Romans, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Are we continue to sin because God will continue to give us grace and his love? Then Paul says, by no means. We should not take advantage of God's grace. We should not uh, continue to sin just so that God can supply us with more <clears throat> grace. Go ahead. Oh, perfect. So we see here that uh, we should not continue to sin. That we should not continue and continue and continue to sin because when we do that, sin brings on destruction and uh, death and a judgment of fire. What, ha what happens if we do the opposite? What happens if we instead if we follow God? Instead, when we sin, uh, we are remorseful and we repent and we try to stop. We try to not continue sin. We don't make uh, God's grace as an excuse to do evil. Well, John chapter 8, verses 12 says exactly what happens in a situation. It says there, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Whoever follows me will not walk in death. Whoever follows me will not walk in sin, but will have the light of life. 
Whoever follows God will have light, will have life forever. When we follow God, when we don't take advantage of his grace, and when we don't sin deliberately, God blesses us with life. Go ahead. So, I know what you're thinking, maybe. Uh, but we all sin, Joe. We all sin. We all fall short of God's grace. So that, does that mean that death always comes for us? That because we always sin and we will always be imperfect and impure, death, destruction, and judgment of fire will inevitably happen. Well, we know that's not true. In John, in First John, chapter two, verses one through two, says exactly this. It says there, "My dear children, I write this to you, so that you will not sin. But if you do, if you do sin, we have the one who spoke to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We all sin. We all fall short of following God completely. We all fall short." Of being pure in our lives. But that doesn't mean we just can continue to sin. That doesn't mean we can continue to fall back into our sin and deliberately sin. God gives us grace. And God will always give us grace, love, and mercy. But we cannot use that as an excuse to sin. We cannot use his love and as an excuse to do evil. Because when we do, we allow sin in our lives. And sin takes advantage of us. But uh, if we, but when we do have sin, we need to repent of it. We need to go to God and ask uh, for repentance. And when we do, we need to try to overcome it. We need to try to push past it and cast it away. The Israelites decided not to do that. The Israelites decided not to cast the Canaanites away. They decided to not listen to God. And because of that, they fell further and further and further into sin. And we need to do the exact opposite. We need to follow God. We need to try to push away that evil. We need to try to push away that evil stuff so that we don't sin. So we don't sin deliberately. And when we do, we can follow God, and God will bless us with eternal life with him someday. <clears throat> so tonight, if you're not baptized yet and you want to be, and you want to be pardoned of your sin, you want your sin to be eradicated, and you want uh, God's grace fully on you, you can come forward and ask for forgiveness. Or if you're already baptized and you are just struggling with sin, you're, you keep on sinning and sinning, you just can't overcome this sin or evil in this life, and you just need some help, you can also come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song. God is
That was excellent, Brian. Excellent lesson, well put together and extremely well delivered. Um, you young people are very fortunate to have Joe in your lives. Uh, if you weren't able to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, you can head out this door, follow Grant, and, uh, and he'll help you with that. Frequently, uh, frequently when I pray for somebody who is uh, uh, ill or troubled or in the hospital, I pray for their just their ability to rest. Because when you're in pain or if you're in emotional distress, just the ability to have confidence uh, in God and get a good night's sleep is so important. So uh, let's sing this beautiful song, Savior, grant me. Rest in peace, let my troubled dreaming cease. And then we'll have our dismissal prayer. Savior Christ, me rest and peace. Let my troubled dreaming cease. With the